أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد والثناء لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين المنتجبين لا سيما بقية الله في الأراضين روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين For the hastening and the return of our Imam, please recite the salawat. Second one for his protection and well-being, inshallah. Inshallah, each and every one of us become a true and close companion of our beloved Imam. Recite the third one even louder. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once again for the blessing of the love of the Ahlul Bayt, for the blessing of life that He provided us with and allowed us to live, to see another month of Muharram, not all believers were able to make it. We thank him for giving us this and for him to provide us with the opportunity to be able to commemorate. There are some who don't have that privilege. They're in hospitals, they're ill at home, they're not able to come, which we should remember, try to pray for, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses them with better health, the ability to inshallah join us in the following years inshallah. We also would like to say, remembering what this night is, perhaps maybe some are thinking why the lights are not being turned on. This is the night that the family of Imam al Hussein salamullah alayhi has lost all the males that could be protective of them. Now they're all in captivity. This is a very sorrowful night. And usually to make note of that, they try to dim the lights on this night. I want to take this opportunity, just at the beginning of the talk, to remind us, this is the last night that usually most people attend for the majalis and the remembrance of Sayyidul Shuhada. It shouldn't be the end of the thought process. It shouldn't be that we get all hyped up, we see each other, positive energy is created, we come together, shed tears, beat our chest, beautiful recitations of poetry for the Ahlul Bayt, which Alhamdulillah this year it was done very well. There was a lot of progress since the four years ago that I was here, Alhamdulillah. All this is happening, we have that positive energy. It shouldn't be like tomorrow we go back to what it was previously. This positive energy has got to have a result, has got to be effective for the rest of the year so that next year when we get together in the month of Muharram again, we take another step forward. Not just make it to where we were last year at Muharram, brothers and sisters. So it's important for us to, to do that. We have to continue and carry on in a different way. In a different way, obviously. We're not going to have majalis every night anymore. But it shouldn't be the end of the thought process, the end of the efforts. It should be the beginning. We get this energy to keep us going, inshallah, for the rest of the year, inshallah. Recite a salawat. <coughs> I 
I tried very hard to try to squeeze that history that we went over and uh, finished somewhat last night. I tried very hard to squeeze it in less sessions, but unfortunately I failed to do so. I, I couldn't find a way where I could explain less and get the points across. So we only have this one night to try to take some lessons looking back at the whole picture. I think it was important, I felt it was very important to run through that history and see the connection of the different events that have taken place in the history of Islam, what the Holy Prophet did, what Amir al-Mu'maneen did, and so on and so forth. Now, in retrospect, we want to look back and see some of the major lessons we can take. I wish we had more sessions to discuss some of these lessons further, but we have this one night and want to make the most of it. There are four points, four lessons, important ones, that I'd like to take from that history. The first is, when we look at the Holy Prophet, we see at the first chance that he has in order to set up the Islamic government, he takes that opportunity and he, set, he sets up the Islamic government and he starts to expand. After the demise of the Holy Prophet, we see Amir al muminins struggle is not with a spiritual status that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him because that spiritual status is there regardless of the people accepting or rejecting. It doesn't matter if people accept the imamat of Amir al muminin or they don't. The imamat is there. God has given. What he went through the struggle of was authority in Muslim society who is going to be having the authority and control over the lives and the wealth and the well-being of the Muslims. That was the struggle between the Holy Prophet and those who set up Saqifa. The 25 years of Amir al muminin although he didn't lead, he didn't have that control and that authority that he would have want to had. But what he did was that he supported the establishment that was there to make sure as much as possible this is preserved. In other words, the responsibility of the Imam was to make sure society is moving in the right direction. In order to fully be able to do so, he would have had to have taken control of the government. He wasn't able to do that, people didn't support that. So he tried to do it on the side. He tried to correct the mistakes of the Khulafa. He tried to prevent them from making serious mistakes. He consulted them to the extent, we didn't say this in those sessions, but it is narrated from the second Khalifa that لَوْلَا Ali لَهَلَكَ Umar. Okay. Why is that said? We know that there's many instances where he has said very wrong things about Amir al-Mu'minin. The reason why he's come out and said that is because the amount of proper guidance that Amir al-Mu'minin provided him with. He was there, he was present, he didn't abandon society. He tried to help keep it within the right tracks as much as possible. But having said that, when you look at the effects of the negative consequences of not having the just ruler that Islam has prescribed for the Muslim society, you see it's devastating. If it was because of this step in the wrong direction that Yazid ibn Abi Sufyan and then Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan came to power in Damascus and it was because of that process that the third Khalifa who was an Umayyad came to power and then created further and further corruption 
and the mushrikeen that now were dressed in the clothes and the robes of Islam and Muslims came and gathered more and more power it's because of the absence of the just ruler as the authority that controls the affairs of the believers then when after 25 years they come and they beg him and they ask him to come he takes control he tries to correct the mistakes the corruptions that were there he tries for five years he is assassinated Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba continues fighting to preserve that government that Islam has prescribed for Muslim society last night we explained that when Imam Hassan realized that in the circumstances he was in there was no way to be able to have that authority implemented in the Muslim society because the support again was gone government was not possible so Imam Hassan took the Islamic guidance and took that Imama and took it again underground it became a movement after having been a government and we explained again last night that the Imams were trying to re-establish that Alawit government, the just government of the Ahlul Bayt. According to that hadith of Imam al-Sadiq, it was supposed to have happen the year 70. We didn't give some of the rest of that hadith, which says that after the year 70, it was postponed until the year 140. During the time of Imam al-Sadiq, again they were supposed to gain power. Again, for various reasons that the believers in that hadith mentions, which I cannot explain. We don't have the time to do so. Imam al-Sadiq explains why. That was again postponed to an unknown time. In other words, the Imams after Imam al-Sadiq were also working towards the same objective. And the Imam of our time is working towards the same objective. We all know that when the Imam of our time comes, he will establish what? He will establish a universal Islamic government the government of justice so you see that connected the, the continuity in the behavior of the Holy Prophet in the Ahlul Bayt the stress on Islam not only being something that is within an individual the same way that aql, the same way that the intellect within one is supposed to control the desires in order to, for one individual to be a pious person in society there needs to be pious people who are just people and their intellects are strongest and their, their knowledge is more than others and they know how to lead in order for them to take control of society so society at large moves in the right direction otherwise you will have corruption otherwise you will move in the wrong direction otherwise power corrupts why are we stressing on this we're living in the United Kingdom you all the brothers and sisters here or in the West the US Canada other European countries are we trying to say are we saying oh Islamic government is so great let's like some of these groups that are coming out and say we want to set up Khilafah in the United Kingdom is this what we're trying to stress on? Absolutely not. Based on the explanations that we gave, we explained. The Holy Prophet didn't establish a government in Mecca when the predominant ideology was that of shirk. He didn't do that. He didn't order his companions to go and kill the heads of Quraysh and set up an Islamic government there. He didn't tell them to go and start stealing things from people to set up this government. He didn't do that. When there was support in Medina, he established it. Why are we saying this? We are saying it because, first of all, it's important to make note of this and realize the ideals of Islam. Secondly, because we all as Muslims and especially as the Shia of the Ahlul Bayt globally should consider ourselves part of the same Hizb, part of the same party, part of the same like-minded people that are trying to accomplish a common goal. What we saw at the time of the Holy Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt 
we see today when it was possible the Shi'i ulama they realize that when it is possible and we have a majority we have the support of the people we have got to do the same thing that the Holy Prophet did we have to do the same thing that Amir al Mu'mineen did. We have to do the same thing that Imam Hassan was trying to work for and establish that government in the year 70 after Hijrah. We've got to do the same. Now, in this part of the world, it isn't possible. But in one part of the world, it was possible. The followers of the Ahlul Bayt established that government. We have a responsibility towards that. We should consider that ours. Everybody's. And we should all be supportive of it. It's a responsibility. This is the exact same thing the Holy Prophet did. It's what Amir al-Mu'mineen fought for. Now that it is established... The sad thing is that there is a move to try to delegitimize the establishment of an Islamic government with the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt. Let me maybe draw a picture of what was going on to see how much we owe this movement and this the students of the Ahlul Bayt who have set up this government. The West grew wealthier and stronger based on their technological advancements and their studies and their sciences which we are seeing. They progressed. That's something that they did better than the Muslim world. Once they got that, they started getting hungry for more and more land, more and more resources. And you know the story. They went and started to take over different regions whether it was Africa it was Asia it was the Americas they started expanding one of the places they went to was the Muslim world do we know what the picture of the Muslim world was like before the establishment of this government and what would have happened if this wouldn't have happened if we would have been sitting here commemorating Imam al Hussein? Let's try to see what was going on. The world war, the first world war comes to an end. You have the Middle East where the believers, the Muslims, Shia and Sunni are. And you have part of Asia, the Indian subcontinent. Westward is pretty much Muslim. You have the Southeast Asia as well. Malaysia and Indonesia, there's plenty of believers over there as well. The Europeans had taken those places over. We had believers fighting over there as well. I don't want to get into that story. I'll start with the Indian subcontinent. The British came and controlled the Indian subcontinent. They took authority over there. They realized that the believers are going to be a thorn in their eye. and Therefore, they did many things in order to prevent the Islamic movement over there. The authority, the control of the British was there very, very strong Okay, in that part of the world. When you look at Egypt, Egypt which has a very long history of Islamic education, the Azhar University there, they were able to bring in governments that eventually fully controlled what goes on in this Islamic educational institution. I have spoken to graduates of Al-Azhar. People that have studied there. One of the things that was very interesting, because I was very interested to know, I haven't visited Egypt, I haven't visited Al-Azhar, I was interested to know what it's like compared to the Shia institution, the Hawza that we have, the seminary that we have in Qum particularly because that's where my experience is. One of the things that I was told because this brother 
had later on converted to Shia Islam because of the Islamic revolution and he came over to Qum and experienced it a bit. And one of the things he said was one of the problems we had when we were in Al-Azhar was that we didn't have a close teacher-student relationship. Teachers were supposed to just come into class, teach certain things. They were very, very controlled. What they say, what they don't say. They get up and leave. Gatherings where Hausa students, the Sunni Hausa students, get together and talk about serious matters, these are all banned. Who becomes the Shaykh of Al-Azhar is controlled by the authorities. Who controls the authorities in Egypt? The West. All their teachings are being controlled. Arabia, where Islam came from and was first born, in order to separate it from the Ottoman Empire, one of the things they did was that they created a deviant ideology. Wahhabism is the product of the West. Brothers and sisters, this is a fact of history. They created deviant Islam for a purpose they had, which we, still, we see still they are making use of their own child that they created in that part of the world deviating Islam and then controlling it if you go those who've been to Hajj know this for a fact I was in Masjid al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alihi inshallah we all get the chance to go and visit the holy prophet the lady Fatima was Zahra and the A'imma in Baqi inshallah there was a group of believers that were reciting ziyarat, jama'a kabira, very quiet, well semi-quietly, there's only maybe 20 of them, and I had joined them. It's just a ziyarat, we're not talking about politics, we're not talking about the Saudi regime, we're not talking about anything, it's just a simple ziyarat for God's sake. And you have these police, the car drives up in front of us and tells us everybody has to leave, and out of everybody they picked on me show an ID. I'm thinking to myself, this is easy. They think I have the hamam on, I was sitting amongst Iranians, they think I'm Iranian as well, they want to put me in jail. I just took out my American driver's license. That's all they had to see, brothers and sisters. If you're American, you're good to go. God forbid you're Iraqi. God forbid you're Iranian. God forbid you're Pakistani. That's it. You're in trouble. I went with the group, was from Australia, an originally Lebanese brother, got caught for no guilt in Masjid al-Haram, where people are supposed to be worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They took him, he was speaking Arabic to them, and he realized these guys are serious, they're going to give him trouble. After he realized they're going to give him trouble, he switched from Arabic to English, he said, guys, I'm Australian. Okay, and you guys are going to be in trouble. Once they figured that out, and he was out in no time. Okay. This is the Saudi regime. Okay, and that part of the world, they took control and they still have control. They created deviant Islam. In the center of the Ottoman Empire, Turkey of today, they brought in a government that was anti-religion. You still see some of the laws that were trying to prevent the strength and the existence, the very existence of religion within the Turkish society. It's a Muslim country. They talk about freedom, but sisters do not have the right to study in university with their hijab on. Even being in governmental offices, public offices with hijab is not allowed there. You think France was the first to do that? It was Turkey that was the first who did that. The West brought in people to destroy religion in Turkey. In Iraq, which used to be part of the Ottoman Empire, they eventually, this is before the revolution, they brought into Iraq 
this person that I can't even mention him as a human being, Saddam. Okay. They have released the documents, brothers and sisters. This is not a conspiracy theory. The facts are there. The Americans have acknowledged this. The CIA brought Saddam into power in Iraq. Do you know what the Hausa went through because of Saddam? How many of our great ulama were killed in Iraq? One of them is Sayyid Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr. One of them is Sayyid Muhammad Sadiq al-Sadr. These are not the only ones. There's plenty of other Shi'i ulama that are killed in Iraq. Plenty of non-ulama of the Shi'i are killed. Anyone who does anything against what Saddam wants, they're dead. Their whole family is killed. You think the Hausa in Najaf was even able at that point to try to worry about getting Islam and Shiism to the rest of the world? They can't. They were trying to hard to preserve the Hausa right there to whatever extent they can. And may Allah reward them for that. In Iran, they brought in a government, the Pahlavi dynasty was brought in by the British and then supported by the Americans. The father was brought in by the British, then they took him out, they brought the son in, the last Shah of Iran. When they brought Pahlavi in, in Iran, they did something very similar that they were trying to do in Turkey, and they did in Turkey. They were trying to do the same thing in Iran as well. They forced hijabs off. You could not come into the streets of Iran if you were a practicing sister. You would have to stay in the home, in the house. You couldn't get out. If you wanted to come out, you had to take off your hijab. They're forcing religion out of people's hearts. They were forcing all of the discos and music and drinking and wine and all of that in Iran. And they created deviant schools of thought. Baha'ism is one of them. Okay. The West is, was eating the Muslim world up. Okay. There's nothing that would have remained in this picture, brothers and sisters. They would have completely destroyed it. The son of Zahra, Imam Khomeini, Sayyid, realizes this threat. Others did as well before him. They, had, they, they tried different things, whether it was the Hawza and Najaf at the time of Mirza and Naini and others they tried they kept trying they, they kept giving lives in order to accomplish this but the one that used the right tactics and the circumstances were ready for him to do this was Imam Khomeini brothers and sisters the West had attacked the Muslim world and was going to choke Islam in its very cradle right there and finish it off Forget about having Islam and Shiism in the West. It would have been destroyed in its home grounds. But because of this revolution, brothers and sisters, now you have these majalis and you have a masajid growing on an annual basis. Where do you think all of these students have studied? these 30, some, 30 odd years when Saddam came in before the revolution, where did all these houses students study that are coming and giving lectures in different parts of the world? Have you ever thought? Alhamdulillah, now the ulama that had moved from Najaf to Qum because of Saddam have been able to go back to Najaf and inshallah we hope that that is going to grow further and further. So that's another service. The ulama of Najaf, many of them were over there in Qum. They're, they've gone back to Najaf now, alhamdulillah. And we have that center growing as well. But during these years, where did these people study? In fact, what's even more interesting, brothers and sisters, because of their animosity against Islam, 
and them realizing that because of this light that has risen from this part of the world and throughout the globe, God knows, I don't know if we have looked into this, you know how much, how many people have been attracted to Islam and Shiism just because of the light that was created over there? When I went to Cape Town, South Africa, I thought the community there were immigrants. Then I realized actually maybe 90 plus percent of them are not immigrants. They are the believers from Cape Town, South Africa that were not Shi'i. They used to be Sunni. What brought them to Shi'i Islam? They're telling me their stories and how it was because of this movement and this revolution. In America, I know many people who accepted Islam and Shi'i Islam because of this. This is our government. This is our movement. The West is seeing this. If all the believers globally would be supportive of the same ideology together, united, moving in the same direction, these guys would be in deep trouble. So one of the tactics is to create hatred even and animosity against this Islamic government. We shouldn't fall prey to that, brothers and sisters. In order to fight and combat this Islam, they have actually paid so much money to build masajid. Print books. Print Qur'ans. One of the things, I remember one of the scholars was telling me, it was pretty interesting. You know, the, the Qur'ans that Saudi Arabia prints and distributes for free throughout the globe, you know, they, they have a, I don't know how many they print annually and give out, right? They're trying to win the support of the people, okay? They do plenty of things to do that. This scholar was in Bosnia, he's Shia. Bosnians are historically Muslim, but they had been kept away from Islam. They were not very knowledgeable of their religion, one of the things he was saying was the Saudis would bring the Qur'ans in and bring people to Islam. All we had to do was just use the same Qur'ans to bring people into Shia Islam. Okay. This money is being pumped in by the West to destroy Islam, but it's helping Islam. And it's all because of this same movement. The point is, brothers and sisters, let, let's not get deviated. Let's not be divided on this. This is not something that we can be divided on. We talked about all that history so we can see this is what the Ahlul Bayt wanted. This is what they fought for. That's the first point. The second point that we want to take from that history and we mentioned this here and there but we want to look at the whole picture and take this lesson from it. Who is or who are the people that we have got to worry about most? Again, considering ourselves one body of believers moving in the same direction, there are people that are opposing us. Who is opposing us? Let's look at the Ahlul Bayt, the Holy Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt. We mentioned that the enemy that started in Mecca and fought the Holy Prophet when he went to Medina and then forcefully accepted Islam in Mecca when the Holy Prophet conquered Mecca and continued to remain within the Muslim Ummah but never accepted Islam. Abu Sufyan Ibn Harb Ibn Umayyah and his children these people started to gain support during the time of the Khulafa especially during the time of Uthman and they grew and gathered more and more support and grew stronger and stronger. And they are the ones that defeated to a certain extent, not completely, to a certain extent. They caused the Ahlul Bayt not to be able to rule for the rest of their presence before the Imam of our time. This enemy was the enemy of shirk. 
even when it came into the and amongst the Muslims, the true nature of it is still shirk and kufr. So the biggest enemy of Islam, brothers and sisters, is kufr. Not your neighbors, of course. Not the general public, of course, obviously. No, this is not what we're saying. Abu Sufyan wasn't the general public. Abu Sufyan is the one whose tyrannical rule and authority is based on kufr. So you have kuffar that have power and have authority, the ones who are trying to choke Islam in its birthplace. These are the real and true enemies of Islam and Muslims and humanity. For them, killing thousands upon thousands of people, even in Vietnam, is absolutely fine. Even having their own soldiers killed for no good reason in Iraq and Afghanistan is fine. The American people are suffering from the rule of that tyrannical regime that is governing that country, my country. Seriously, I'm not exaggerating here. The problem is like the people of Sham, they were being pushed around, doing all the wrong things and being oppressed. But they thought Muawiyah was actually very good for them. That's the same thing over there in the U.S. And in this part of the world as well. This is the reality, brothers and sisters. Kufr is the biggest enemy, not fellow Muslims. Why do we get this equation wrong? A lot of times we seem to be more interested in debating and fighting, whether it's on the streets, whether it's in the masajid, on satellite channels. We're fighting fellow Muslims. Are they the enemies? They're not the enemies. The enemy is kufr. A'immatul kufr. The ones that are leading kufr against Islam. They are the real enemies of Islam. And if any, the, the other one, the, the line of nifaq. If anyone is connected and attached to that to the tawagit, to the centers of power, tyrannical power, whose ideology is complete disbelief in any god. They're not Christian. Okay. This is not Christianity. American Christians can tell you, real Christians, not the ones that have been fed with all the misinformation. There are some that are waking up to this reality. See, let me describe this line of nifaq a bit in our context. Remember, we said at the time of Amir al-Mu'mineen, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan is the most dangerous form of nifaq because it's complete shirk covered with the clothing and the robes of Islam. We shouldn't be looking for that and say, oh yeah, this guy or that guy is like that in this day and age. We shouldn't be looking like at that or trying to find somebody like that in this day and age. Why? Because in that day and age, the Islamic empire had developed and emerged to be the superpower. We don't necessarily understand this. They had destroyed the Persian empire they had pushed the Roman Empire back. The Romans didn't feel the strength to really fight these guys. The superpower of the time was the Muslim Empire. So there was no outside enemy trying to attack it anymore. Seriously. It was within. It is the Kuf that had remained within that is pushing it in the wrong direction. In today's day and age, that's a different story. You know what our circumstances are like? Like the circumstances of the Holy Prophet when he first moved to Medina. 
the verses of the Holy Quran condemn the believers that try to make contact and try to get connected with the center of the tyrannical power, the kufr in Mecca. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemns that. In this day and age, the nifaq is with people who seem to be believers, but they try to make good contact and work for the powers of kufr, the a'immatul kufr. They are the serious nifaq that we have to be worried about. This was the second point. Knowing who is the real enemy, not getting it wrong. The third point, which is related to the fourth point, I'll mention the third and fourth together. With regards to the believers themselves, there were two major problems that existed that caused that kufr to be able to come in and take control and take the authority out of the hands of Amir al-Mu'mineen and the Ahlul Bayt. One was the lack and the absence of Basira. Easily being tricked, being naive, not knowing what's going on, lies are thrown out, people hear the lies, they're either convinced that the lies are truth, or they're just confused, and that confusion prevents them from moving in the right direction and taking steps in the right direction. That was a problem that we saw during that time. It was a very, very terribly big problem that Amir al-Mu'maneen faced. And the biggest problem was in Sham. You know what? I think I mentioned this briefly in some of the previous sessions, but maybe not as much as I'm about to. Sometimes, you know what I'm surprised at? It surprises me that some people trust more the BBC or the CNN or Fox News or Sky and they're not willing to hear the believers and the words of the believers. They prefer the words of the kuffar which have been put there, these establishment, in order to give the picture they want to the masses saying oh they're trustworthy but when the muslimin and the news agencies of the muslimin of the shia come out and say no that's a lie that's wrong this is what it is we're like ah oh, these guys are lying they're paid by the iranian government like really and the bbc is not paid by the british government I think it's reversed. The verse of the Quran says, "In ja'akum fasiqun binaba'in fatabayyanu," not "In ja'akum adilun binaba'in fatabayyanu." If it's a fasiq, which the worst form of fisq is kufr, disbelief in God, then check the news. We reverse that. We say, "No, no, no." If it comes from them, we gotta check it. These guys have an agenda. So can. And then when you say, no, 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 it's these guys who have the agenda, like conspiracy theory. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. I don't know what has happened to us. I don't know what has happened to us. What happened to the principles of Islam? Why don't we see the picture the way it is? We're repeating the same mistakes. We're naive. We're easily tricked into believing what the enemies of Islam want us to believe. As long as the Muslim masses are like this, and as long the masses globally are like this, the Imam of our time is not going to come because we're going to do the same thing to him. He sets up a base in Mecca, just imagine, 
And then the enemies start fabricating things and they bring loads of people with turbans, some of them black, some of them white, some of them green, some of them God knows what color. And they'll say, yeah, this guy is actually, here's the book. It says that the imam is going to have this sign or is going to look like that or his mother is like this, his mother is like that. That's not the imam. We're like, oh yeah, it's the BBC. They're, they're unbiased. Seriously. I'm not trying to joke here. As long as the masses are like this, the imam is not going to come. You know what I'm afraid of? I'm afraid that more non-Muslims are waking up to this reality. And then when the imam comes, they'll see he's saying the truth. And these guys are lying. They'll follow him. And we're still stuck and glued on to their news. And we follow them. As hadith says this. have to raise our awareness. So what do we do? How do we do this? One of the things we have to do, brothers and sisters, is study the events that are taking place around us. Some of us don't even check the news. That's very wrong. You want to be the Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib, you can't be like that. You have to check the news. Some of us just, just run through the news and they don't really know what's going on. Sometimes you British like to make fun of the Americans. They had this clip online. They were going in the streets of New York asking people, where is, for example, Iran? Like in South America. That's how uninformed. They're trying to say, it's not true. But sometimes we're like this. Like, who's this guy? Like, uh, I don't know. We have to look into it, not just breeze through the news. You have to study it. Figure out what they're trying to do. Read it, not in the way they want you to read it, but read it to figure out what's really going on. When Muawiyah was, was lying at the time of Amir al-Mu'mineen, the clever believers were the ones that would be able to realize what he's actually trying to get out of this lie. What is he trying to do? Once you figure out what the enemy is trying to do, then you counter it. If we continue reading and studying the news and trying to sharpen our skills of figuring out what's really going on, reading history sometimes is very beneficial. Reading up on the events that are currently taking place, also, tapping into the analysis provided by those who have learned the skills. You know, when you want to learn a skill, you don't just read it in books. You don't just go and start pedaling in the water if you want to learn how to swim. You may learn how to swim, but you're probably not going to get the right tactics and the right techniques of, of swimming. You want to learn to become the best swimmer, you go find the best swimmer, and you ask them about, okay, how do you do this? And they'll, they'll train you by watching even. Them swim, you can learn. Okay, This is what you have to do. You have to tap into the believers, because they need to be trustworthy, that have been able to learn the skill well. There are a number of them. Probably. But there's one I'd like to suggest. There's one that I'd like to suggest. That has, has the knowledge of the deen, of the religion. Has knowledge of the recent history very well. Of the Islamic movements. Of the Western movements that were created within the Muslim world. And what they were trying to accomplish. And has had a lot of experience and it has access to a lot of information that maybe a lot of us don't have. It's one of our ulama. It's Ayatollah Khamenei. I strongly recommend his speeches are translated. They're on the site Khamenei.ir Even if you don't want to believe in him or whatever, because there's different things that are said, that's not my point. At least as someone that has had the expertise 
and has had the experience and knows Islam as well, read it, try to think about it, or put that into perspective as well. I really, through my experience, what I have read, different political analysts inside Iran, outside Iran, out of the believers, out of the disbelievers, these last 14, 15 years that I have been more into this, I really personally, this is a very, very sincere claim that I'm trying to make. I'm not, some people, I heard somebody said that this guy's on, in his words, Khamenei's payroll. Believe me, I'm not. <laughs> okay. Whatever that means in the first place. It's like, I'll, I'll, I'll skip on that. People may get the wrong impression. I'm, I'm not. Okay. It's very clear. Those who know what that means, if there's any meaning to that, know that I'm not in any way on anybody's payroll. This is my very sincere uh, and very honest understanding over the years that I haven't found anyone that in this day and age is as accurate and as precise in analyzing and expressing what's actually going on. I've tested his analysis and his predictions, his predictions tested them over and over and over like he has a really good understanding of even the West when the demonstrations were happening in Tahrir Square nobody thought that you're going to have the Wall Street movement in America and in Europe he said you'll see it in America and in Europe within a month we were seeing it I'm like subhanallah it's good to use the expertise and benefit from the expertise of people. This is one individual. If you don't want to only refer to him, it's up to you. But I think it's good to refer to him as well. I personally choose to read every single one of his statements and lectures. And I've started doing this religiously the last four years because I've seen more and more benefit in this. Last point is the other problem that believers had and we always have was the problem of hawa'un nafs that's a serious problem a very serious problem it causes one to see the truth but say you know what I'm not going to go with it because I'm worried about my work I'm worried about my status my citizenship status my status as a citizen, already a citizen, a naturalized citizen, or someone who was born, worried about these different things. And because of that, we don't follow the truth. And we bring excuses. Hawa'un nafs is a serious danger to every single one of us, brothers and sisters. In fact, it's even related to the previous discussion. The previous discussion, the previous point being naive, not having that basira, not having insight. There's a beautiful hadith from Amir al-Mu'mineen. He describes fitna. Fitna is where haqq and batil get mixed up. People get confused. That is fitna. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, describes in just maybe 10-15 sentences, describes what causes fitna, what they do in a fitna, and how you can be saved of fitna. It's found in Nahjul Balagha and also it's found in Al Kafi. He says, Innama bad'u wuku al fitan ahwa'un tu taba' wa ahkamun tu taba' there will be desires that will be followed. And in fitna, some people are following their desires. And they will be creating bid'ah, lying. And it continues, I don't want to get to that part. At the end of it, he says, you think if haq was clear, or if people would only be saying haq, 
there would be no difference. Nobody would be deferring with another. The reason why you have difference is because not everybody is saying what is haqq. And he says, if it was only batil, if it was only lies, then you don't have to worry about anyone who has a bit of intellect because you can identify the lie. If the BBC would be constantly lying, you could say, oh, these guys are not trustworthy, like Fox. Okay, that's how Fox is. That's for the dumb people. Okay. They lie so many times in it, I think even if they say the day is the night, some people will believe them. Dummies watch that and they're fooled. But those who are a bit smarter, you need to give them nine truths to get them on the tenth one and lie to them on the tenth one. Okay. You need to give 19 true facts to lie on the twentieth and people believe you. Okay. He says this is what they do. They mix these two. وَلَكِنْ يُؤْخَذْ مِنْ هَذَا ذِخْثٌ You take a part of this, حَقْ وَمِنْ هَذَا ذِخْثٌ A bit of batil, and you mix them, فَيُمْ زَجَانْ فَهُنَا لِكَ اسْتَحْوَضَ الشَّيْطَانُ عَلَىٰ أَوْلِيَاءِهِ That's when shaitan takes control of his awliya. I said this whole hadith for this. He says at that point, you know who is going to be following the batil in fitna? He says, هُنَا لِكَ اسْتَحْوَضَ الشَّيْطَانُ عَلَىٰ أَوْلِيَاءِهِ Shaitan takes control of his awliya. Who are his awliya? According to the Qur'an. Anyone who disobeys God, follows their desires, follows the whisper of the shaitan, shaitan is their wali. Okay. So hawa'u nafs has to do with that as well. One of the reasons why people get really confused at, time, at the time of fitna, and they're not able to figure out what's right and what's wrong, is because prior to the fitna, they hadn't gone through self-development. Brothers and sisters, we got to go through this. We got to care what we do for work, for living. We have to make sure our finances are dealt with in an Islamic matter. We have to make sure on a daily basis from the morning until the night, we don't commit any sins. That's the Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Imam al-Baqir tells Jabir al-Ju'fi, he says, you think it is sufficient for our Shia to have our love? Isn't the love, the Imam says, these are not my words. He says, the love of the Holy Prophet is above the love of the Ahlul Bayt. If somebody says, I love the Holy Prophet, but doesn't follow the Sunnah of the Holy Prophet, is that right? He says, the only way, it's a long hadith, says, the only way you can become our wali, our follower, our Shia, it's through obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We've got to practice this, brothers. It takes a long time to master it. It takes a long time so that it's no longer that my desires control me, but it's I who control my desires. And I can easily, as the verse of the Holy Quran says, وَإِذَا مَرُّوا بِاللَّغْوَ مَرُّوا kirama." Forget about sin when they come around things that are just useless. Believers walk by it, they don't even care to bother to look and see what it is. Sometimes we just have to look at every scene. An attractive billboard. And we have to look at it to see it's a picture that I'm not supposed to see. Well, just don't look. In the first place. Don't tune in to channels that have that garbage on them to poison your soul. This is the Shia of Amirul Mu'mineen. I think if you don't control your eyes, you're going to be able to see the amount of our time. If we don't control where our money comes, Imam of our time would want to come into our house. It's ghasp. I'm not going to come into that house. Say one of the very strong believers who was into construction in Qum. One of the scholars told me. He said, when I wanted to build, the scholar was telling me, when I wanted to build my house, I went and told him, uh, do you have any 
advice for me in building my house? He said, build your house in a way that if the imam was, would be passing by, he would like to drop by your place. Okay. We have to live our lives in a way where we can ask the question from the imam of our time, Afaradit. Are you pleased with this lifestyle? The way I treat my children, what I buy for them? Be careful, brothers and sisters. You don't want to poison your next generation. The poor child thinks that it's a good thing to have an iPad or some other tablet or some phone or, and they keep asking for it and you give it to them and they have internet and that's dangerous. When their apple falls on the floor and you think maybe there's germs on it, you're like, no, 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 you can't do that. You don't pick that up. I'm going to wash it. I'll give you another one. Because there may be some germs there that can affect the health of the body of your child. But this device that is filled with poison, they have access to everything. And the innocent child cannot differentiate. It's not service to the child to give them this. It's not a good, you're not being a good parent. You say, oh, they wanted this and I bought it for them. No. Same way that when, if the child drops their food and they cry to have it back, you're not a good parent if you pick it up and say, go ahead, have it, take a bite. Drops in the street. Pick it up, eat it. It's not a good parent. How on nafs, brothers and sisters, there are many dangers from this perspective. And we have to consider ourselves those strong soldiers and believers that the Holy Prophet was trying to build in Mecca based on which he was able to establish Medina. And the Imam of our time is looking for to strengthen them even more in, or, in order to establish his government. We've got to think that that's what we're doing. They've already given us the instructions. We just have to follow through, brothers and sisters. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum Ya Ahl Bayt al-Nubawma Wa ma'udha al-Risala ومختلف الملائكة ومهبط الواحي ومعدن الرحمن وخزان العين May Allah's peace and blessings be upon you, my beloved Holy Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon you. It was in your homes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us with guidance and revelation. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon you. Angels descend upon you. Day in and day out. Sallallahu alayhi ya Aba Abdullah. Sallallahu alayhi ya Mazlub. Sallallahu alayk Ayyuha al-Shaheed Bikar bala 
عطشانا May Allah's peace and blessings be upon you. My beloved Imam al Hussain. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon you. My beloved oppressed Imam. The Imam that was slaughtered by the shores of the Euphrates while his mouth was dry of thirst. Sallallahu alayhi Brothers and sisters, what is happening at these moments in Karbala? Imagine the women and children of Imam al Hussain finding half burnt tents to try to have some cover during this night. They have to seek protection from the half-burnt tents. Why? Because they don't have Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas to protect them. They don't have Ali al-Akbar to protect them. They don't have Imam al Hussain to protect them. Imagine these women and children with thousands and thousands of ruthless men. The man who didn't have mercy to a six month old baby in the arms of his father are now unleashed. The men that while Imam al Hussein was alive, they say, Sallallahu alayka ya Abdullah, when you were on the ground, they say Imam al Hussein was so brave, the enemy was so frightened of the Imam that although he was on the ground, he was not moving. The enemies were not sure if he's alive or not. They didn't feel or they didn't have the bravery to go and see if he's alive. They were trying to think, how do we see if Hussein is alive or not? Shimr ibn Dhil Jawshan al Mal'oon said, attack the tents of Hussein. <laughs> When he called to tag the tents of Hussain, your beloved Imam forced himself up. He got up on his knees. He said, Ya Shia to Ali Abi Sufyan, Illam takunu mu'mineen, Fakunu ahraran fi dunyakum. O followers of Abu Sufyan, if you're not religious, at least be free in this world world I'm still alive how can you attack my women and children imagine now they've been unleashed they say the enemy themselves say they started attacking the women and children beating on them to be able to take whatever they could if they would find clothes on the women veils on the women la ilaha illallah it's difficult to even picture them pulling and snatching the clothes of the women and children. 
happen. But one of the most painful things that is written in some books is that, unfortunately, they didn't even have the patience of properly taking the earrings out. They just pulled the earrings and made the ears bleed. Sallallahu alayki ya aqilatu bani Hashem. Imagine Zainab trying to move, catch these children before they are attacked. Imagine how many times she has been beaten on. Probably going in between those men and the children so that the children are not beaten and she is instead. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.